Today we are continuing our series, Like Jesus. Like Jesus. To be like Jesus is more than just clicking a thumbs up button on Facebook, right? It takes more than just liking something. We want to be like Jesus. We want to become more like Jesus. We want to practice not just what he taught, but how he lived. And when we read the Gospels and we read the Bible, what we want to do is not just pay attention to what he taught, although that's very important, We also should pay attention to how Jesus lived, how he acted, and so we could learn to act like Jesus acted. In fact, uh, there's a study, and people have done many years of studies, and they've become known as the spiritual disciplines. Studying the way Jesus taught and acted are known as spiritual disciplines, and that's kind of what this series is about, spiritual disciplines. Last week, I talked about a cool one called rest, to rest like Jesus. Uh, next week, I'm going to talk about serve like Jesus, and after that, worship like Jesus. Then Pastor Ron, my dad, he's going to talk about pray like Jesus, and then Pastor Claire is going to end the series uh, with their great message as well. And so we're doing all these things to be like Jesus, and they're spiritual disciplines. One interesting thing about a discipline and just not just spiritual, but disciplines in general. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but disciplines are a way to access power. Now, I don't know if you thought about it like this, but it's really interesting. They help us to access power. I'll give you an example in my life. I have all these injuries from playing football, just all over. One of which my many injuries, and my wife would tell you, I'm always complaining about them, walking around, you know, like I can't move. One of them is my shoulders. And for a couple of years, I stopped doing a lot of stuff, and I tried to play basketball a couple of years ago, and I couldn't, like, shoot the ball because my shoulder was hurt. I couldn't do push-ups. My shoulders hurt. And so I remembered these exercises we used to do, and they're not really, uh, they're like exercises you may do after shoulder surgery, and they're with bands, but we used to do them in football all the time, and they're for shoulders. And so I started doing these shoulder exercises all the time I would do them, and these, I'd keep doing them and doing them, and the purpose in doing these exercises wasn't to do the exercise. The discipline I started to do these wasn't just to do the exercise, the purpose in them was to have my shoulders be stronger, more flexible, and have the strength return to do things I couldn't do before. The purpose in the discipline wasn't to do the discipline, but it was gain access to a power to do things with my shoulders that I couldn't do before the discipline, right? And that's the same thing with spiritual disciplines, We don't just do spiritual discipline just so we could check it off our religious box, just so we could say, oh, I've been a good boy, I've been a good girl today, this is why I do the discipline. No, we do spiritual disciplines so we could gain access to a power we don't have without them. Just like I did these shoulder exercises so my shoulders could have power that they didn't have before the discipline started. And many of us in our lives, including me, I need access to a power that I don't have. I don't know where you're at in your life, but maybe you just can't control your anger, right? You just try every, I'm not going to get mad this time, and you get mad, right? You just don't have the power to control it. You just don't have any patience. Maybe for you, you just don't, you can't focus. I I try to focus, and it never works out. Uh, Maybe for you, it's like you just, you can't stop lusting or looking or watching bad things. Maybe you you try to clean up your mouth, right? You just swear, you're just rude, you're mean, you just, but Things come out of your mouth you don't want them to do. Or maybe for you, it's another bad habit that you want to kick and you just can't stop it. Maybe it's not something bad, you just want to be better, right? You want to be a better father or you want to be a a better mother or a spouse. You want to learn to work hard or I don't know what it may be. But a lot of times we want to do something and we feel like our own, we don't have the power. And so what do we do? We start a discipline that gives us access to that power. And that's exactly what spiritual disciplines do. But they do it on an even greater level because it's opening our mind and our hearts and our spirits to the power of the Holy Spirit working in us and through us to allow this awareness and strengthening to happen in our lives. And so we start spiritual disciplines not just to be religious, but because there's an access to power we get when we become disciplined in these areas. And this is why we look at the habits of Jesus, not just what he taught, but how he lived, so we could be like Jesus. Now, in my mind, and I talk about the subject a ton, is the greatest way to get access to this power that we need in our lives. By far the best discipline, I believe, is to read your Bible. And so today I'm going to talk about read like Jesus. Read like 
Jesus. One of the greatest things we could do in our lives is to consistently read our Bibles. It will help us so much. John chapter 1 verse 14 says this. So the word became human and made his home among us. The word of God became human, made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. They're talking about Jesus. Jesus is the word of God. And it's saying he became human. He became flesh, some, some versions say. He came down to earth. Jesus is God's word. Everything Jesus did was, God, what was God's word said. When you see Jesus acting and talking and moving, that's God's word alive so we could see a tangible thing of what God's word is and how it's supposed to act in life. And so if we want to be, have access to this power, we need to not only listen to what Jesus taught, but live how he lived. Why? Because he is God's word. He was the very presence of God in his word on earth. That's why reading the Bible is so important. Reading God's word is so incredibly important for Jesus followers. There's no way you could be a true disciple and grow closer to Jesus without reading the Bible. Because Jesus is God's word. How could you not read God's word but follow God's word and not ever read it or not know what it is? It's so important for us to consistently read it because we want to become more like Jesus. Hebrews 4.12 says it like this, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It's alive and powerful in our lives. It is sharper than the sharpened two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. The truth is, none of us have this power to become like Jesus, right? No matter how hard I try on my own, I'll never be like Jesus. However, through the discipline of reading God's word, we gain access to a power to begin to live a life closer and closer to like Jesus, to become a disciple, a learner of Jesus. Just as me working out wasn't the purpose to work out. Working out, you don't work out just to work out. There's a purpose, whether you want to lose weight, be healthier, get stronger, have your shoulders work so you can do push-ups and play, right? Whatever it is, there's another purpose. And sometimes we think of spiritual disciplines as that's the only reason we do them is because we're told to do them. No. There's an access to a power we gain when we begin to do these spiritual disciplines because God's word is alive and powerful. That's right. And this is why I want to start the year off by reading the Bible together. And so we're going to start today, we're going to have this Bible reading plan. I'm going to take a minute to explain it. What we did was we found a really unique uh, Bible reading plan on the YouVersion Bible app that's super simple. All right, all it is is reading through the Gospel of Luke. There's four Gospels, right, and the, the name of the person wrote each Gospel, so Luke wrote this one. And it's essentially just Jesus' time here on earth that Luke wrote about. The Gospel of Luke has 24 chapters. Starting today, we're going to read one chapter a day. That's it. Now, if you're not familiar with the Bible, let me just tell you something really cool. Chapters in the Bible are a lot shorter than chapters in a book, okay? So one chapter a day is nothing. Trust me, okay? I could do this, right? This is easy. One chapter a day. And then if you use the YouVersion Bible app, after you read the chapter, not only does it track your progress, but it has like an 8 to 10 minute audio you could listen to to kind of explain what you read, apply it to your life, it's really cool. And it helps you say you miss a day, it'll tell you you missed a day. And say you don't like technology, you just want to read it out of your Bible, fine. Just read one chapter a day starting today, and it ends the end of January. 24 days is January 31st. Super simple. One chapter a day starting in Luke chapter 1. Now, if you want to use uh, the, uh, oh, before that, and then Pastor Ron, my dad, is having this really cool study group. It's not going to start this Tuesday. But the following Tuesday, for three Tuesdays in a row, at 6.30, right in our church, you could come and go as you please. You don't even have to sign up. He's just going to be there. And if you want to ask questions, any kind of question, no question is too silly, right? Any question you want to ask about chapters in the Bible, about what you're reading, he's there. He's got like a doctorate in ministry. He knows a lot of stuff. And he loves to talk with people and help you understand the Bible. So starting next week as we're reading, say you want to talk to someone more about it. You have questions about what this said or what you don't understand what's happening. And why do they use these words? Why are there different versions? How do they break them up in chapters? I don't know what your question may be. But pass around would be there. You could just come and go and ask questions uh, and, and learn more about it. So I really want to invest in this time to read our Bibles together.
Lastly, now you might not know what the YouVersion Bible app is. So what I did was, I, I, I'm, there's a video here we're going to watch how to find it, okay? So you go on your phone. You watch this video, and I just typed in my web browser, lovejoy.org, okay? Lovejoy.org, that is our website. You go on our website, see, it's going to pop up on your phone like that, and you scroll down to the bottom, you keep scrolling, and there it is, part one, Luke explained, read through Luke together. You click the blue button, and boom, it pops up. If you already have the YouVersion Bible app, it'll take you to your app. If not, you may have to just download the app, and that's how you do it, and you hit start plan. All right, that's that simple. So you go lovejoy.org, scroll down, click it, and start reading the plan, and it tracks your progress. You could create an account. You could have friends. I mean, you could do tons of stuff on this app. It's amazing. But when you start the plan, it has on your phone Luke chapter 1, and it has the audio to watch. So it's very simple, and I want us all to do it together. I'm going to do it too. We're going to start today Luke chapter 1, one chapter, and you just take it through to the end of January. Really, really easy to do it. And then on Tuesday, Saturday next week, Pastor Ron will have this open group uh, for you to come and talk more about it. But it's a great discipline to start, a really simple way we can all do it. If you already have your own Bible reading plan, adding one chapter a day won't even affect it. You can do that with us. So very cool. Back to the message. Disciplines give us access to power. Today I want to talk about Three things the Bible gives us power to do. Three things the Bible gives us power to do. Number one, it gives us power to conquer sin. To conquer sin. This is kind of my main point today, but it's a really good point, and I think it's really helpful in what a lot of us are thinking about, at least I'm thinking about. The Bible gives us power to conquer, to overcome sin, to overcome temptation. Now let's just be honest with each other. It's so easy to sin in our world today, isn't it? We have access to virtually any kind of sin you could think of. You can invent new ones, right? We have access to it all as much as we want, and most of it is right in our phone, right? I mean, you could literally access virtually any kind of thing you want to access immediately, and it's all in our pockets. Not only do we have unlimited access to sin and anything that's wrong, but our culture encourages us, doesn't it? We're like encouraged to do these things. The nudity, profanity, hatred, murder, lust, adultery, the immorality, you name it, is on virtually every single show we watch right now. Even commercials. Like we're watching football, i got to have my kids cover their eyes for commercials, right? It's crazy, this stuff that's happening. Not only do we have unlimited access, our culture encourages us, but oftentimes we're kind of ostracized or looked down upon when we don't participate, right? It's easy to sin today. In fact, I remember uh, my, my college buddies, or my high school and college buddies, they don't understand how I've never watched Game of Thrones. They, they, don't, they can't comprehend. They ask me all these questions like, you don't like it? Why don't you watch it? It's because it's a messed up show. Like, I can't watch that stuff, right? They don't get it. I remember when I was in college and I really started serving Jesus and I stopped drinking and getting drunk with my buddies and going to bars and going to strip clubs. One of my friends got mad at me. I'm trying to clean my life up, and he's mad at me for doing the right thing. Why? It's so easy to sin. It's so difficult to go live in a higher standard in our world. Nowadays, if you're not hooking up with somebody, sleeping with your boyfriend or girlfriend, right, people look down at you. Nowadays, you know what they say, younger generations? It's boring to be straight. That's what they say. It's boring. Like you can't even, it's crazy the the attacks and everything. We're kind of forced to believe what other people Belief. And I love how the psalmist says it. Psalm 119.9 says, How can a young person stay pure? By obeying your word. Verse 11 says it like this. I have hidden your word in my heart. The next verse. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. There's something about the word of God that gives us power to overcome and conquer sin. We see in the life of Jesus that he used God's word to overcome temptation. What I want to do is, is read kind of a larger part of Scripture. It's in, in, it's in uh, Luke, so you'll get it in four days. You'll get to this part of Scripture. It's in Luke. In my Bible... The title, the heading of this section of scripture is this. It's the temptation of Jesus. 
Okay, so Jesus is being tempted to sin, and Jesus overcomes sin. And so we're going to read about 13 verses, Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 1. And I just want you to kind of stick with me as we read this narrative of Jesus overcoming temptation, conquering sin. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all the that time and became very hungry. Then the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus told him, No. The scriptures say, he's talking about the word of God, people do not live by bread alone. Verse 5. Then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said. Because they are mine to give to anyone I please. Verse 7, I will give it all to you if you will worship me. Jesus replied, the scriptures say, God's word, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to a third time to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say we will order his angels to protect you and guard you. And they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he was done tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. How did Jesus overcome temptation? By the power of the word of God. Every time Jesus was tempted, he quoted scripture. Now, I want you to think about this. Jesus quoted scripture. What does that mean? That means he knew scripture. If he quoted it, that means he had it memorized so he could speak it. But even more than knowing scripture, this is what I want you to understand, is his natural reaction to temptation. His natural response to something attacking him was God's word coming out of his mouth. What is my natural response to temptation? What is your natural response to things not going well? It's usually not speaking God's word, right? It might be throwing something, yelling, screaming, getting angry, getting frustrated. Those are just me. I don't know what you do, but those, that's what I do, right? We, our natural response isn't that. What happened with Jesus? The word of God was so deep inside of him because he didn't just read it. He repetitively read it. He thought about it. He studied it. He pondered it. He meditated on it. Whatever words you want to use, it was in him so deeply that when something attacked him, what came out? God's word came out. What naturally comes out of you when you're tempted, when you're struggling, well, it depends on what you're filling yourself with. Whatever comes out of you means what you're filling yourself with first. I remember When I first gave my life to Jesus, I was living in a college house with like eight other guys. We were living these crazy lives. And and I'm so thankful this happened. I just started reading the Bible. And I mean, I would read it. One time I read through the whole Bible two times in one year. And I was in college studying. And I was reading the Bible, reading the Bible, reading the Bible, reading the Bible. And something began to happen where I was able to leave certain lifestyles and, and, and overcome temptation in a way where, trust me, I'm not perfect, but it really helped me in such a way because I gained access to a power through reading God's word. My response to people began to change. How I looked at things began to change because what I was filling myself with was alive and powerful because God's word is alive and powerful and we need to fill ourselves with it. I love how the psalmist says it. He says, how do we stay pure? We obey your word. But how do we obey your word? We hide it in our hearts. That means we bury it so deeply that it's what we fill ourselves with more than Netflix, more than TV shows, more than football games. God's word fills our lives so it's in our hearts. So when we're attacked, when we're struggling, when we're hurting, what naturally comes out of us is God's word. It's beautiful. We have, it's powerful. It's access to power. One thing I've learned early on was the importance of repetition, to repeatedly read the word of God over and over again. This is so important. Why? Because our world is repeatedly telling us the opposite of God's word all day, every day. It's said that we are exposed to almost 4,000 
1,000 ads a day telling us what we need to do, how we should look, and how we live our lives. More so the reason we need to repeatedly read God's word. The more we read and reread, the more we speak and repeat, the more we think about and think about and think about again, the more our thoughts, our hearts, our attitudes change. And when that happens, that eventually leads to a change in behavior. We've all heard the saying, garbage in, garbage out, what you eat, what you, you are what you eat, right, things like that. Well, it's the same things with what we feed our minds and our hearts and our spirits. We keep feeding them garbage, we're going to start spitting out garbage. We're going to start acting like that. But we feed them good things, right, we're eventually going to speak out and do good things. Here's the frustrating part with all of it. It's not a one-time deal. I wish it was. <laughs> I really do, but how many times in my life do I kind of uh, uh, drift away from this, right? Just because I did it in college doesn't mean I'm set for the rest of my life. Lord knows that. My wife knows that. My kids know that, right? Uh, Every time I begin to drift away from this, the world, all the ads, everything, my natural inclinations become to come back, and I struggle, and I have to sometimes come back and swing the pendulum back to reading God's Word, spending time in God's Word. It's a constant battle with our flesh until we die and go to heaven. This is something thing we're going to have to constantly do is to read God's word. Sometimes I feel powerless to change. And I am powerless to change. That's why I discipline myself to read my Bible. Not just to read it so God thinks I'm a good child of God. I read my Bible to gain access to a power I wouldn't have had before. To overcome sin, to overcome temptation. The Bible gives us power to overcome sin. And number two, to experience freedom. More and more now people in our world are not free. Ask any counselor, any therapist, look at the statistics of abuse, of depression, of suicide. They're all on the rise. Sure, we have freedom in America, but we aren't free. We're a slave to something. John 8 32 says this, and you will know the truth. Jesus said this, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now here's the thing. We often think the truth alone sets us free, but that's not what Jesus said. He said, you will know the truth. You will have a knowledge, an understanding, a comprehension, a grasp of the truth. And that knowledge, that understanding of how the truth works That sets you free. And when we take time to read God's word, to reflect on it, to ponder it, to meditate on it, to study it, to let it apply it to our lives, we begin to know and understand God's word more and more. That's one reason I'm excited to read this Bible plan together because it includes a couple minute audio for us to listen to, to learn more, to explain what we've read. That's also why I agonize over all my messages every week. I, I, I just spend so much time in each message because I don't just want to say God's word. I want us to understand it. I want us to know it. I want us to apply it to our lives so we can all experience freedom. You might think, well, what about our children? What about the next generations? I think about my kids. How can I raise my son and daughters to keep themselves pure? How can I help them know God's truth when the schools, when the media, when their friends are going to try to teach them the opposite? One way to do that is to build a foundation in them right now so they have God's word hidden in their hearts. This is why it's so important that not only you come to church, but your children come to church. If you don't feel like coming to church one day and you have kids, you got to suck it up and bring your kids anyways. Because they need to get here. I'm just being honest. They need to be here. Kevin, our youth director, my mom, Pastor, my mom, Pastor Judy, and Pastor Claire, they work hard so your kids can learn God's word. Yeah, they have fun. Don't get, don't get confused at the parties they have and the skits they do. They're learning God's word. It's so important for children to be in church. It breaks my heart when children want to come to church, but they don't have a ride. It's so important that they come, but I just also want to be honest. One day a week isn't enough. 
It's not enough. At home, we need to do a foundation throughout the week with them. Something small, reading the Bible with them. In fact, what's really cool is Pastor Claire is doing the same exact Bible reading plan with the Kids and Forever Kids. So if you have a kid in Forever Kids or a young child, you could do the Bible reading plan with them. Read it once by yourself and read it with them. Read it just with them. Whatever you want to do, help them do this. The sooner you do it, the less they'll know any, any, any other way. My kids think the only book we can read at night is the Bible. They don't know anything else, all right? Don't tell them. It's the only book they can read before bed is the Bible. They don't know yet, right? But the sooner we do it, the better it is for them, the more it helps them. Why? I think about it like this. When I think of children and raising people up, I think of the scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It's a mirror to help us see what's good and what's wrong. It corrects us when we are wrong, and it teaches us to do what is right. If you're having trouble, teach your kids to do what is right. Start reading the Bible with them constantly, over and over, as much as you can. Squeeze it in wherever you could. Trick them into reading it. Whatever you got to do, get them to read God's Word. What's the purpose of God's Word? According to this scripture, it's not so our theology is right. It's not so we have perfect doctrine. It's not so we can argue this church or this or this. Who cares about that stuff? It's to teach us what is right and wrong and to help us do the right thing. If we don't teach our children right and wrong, the kids on the bus will. TikTok will. Instagram will. If we don't teach them what is right, the wrong influences are going to try to teach them what is right and wrong. A discipline of reading the Bible is about an inner transformation that brings power to conquer sin and experience freedom. Freedom is missing in our generation. It's not about acquiring a ton of information. It's not how many scriptures you know. Don't feel pressured if you don't understand everything. You don't have to have perfect recall on what you read. I, man, I still get so confused and I, I always mix up ver- verses and versions and there's all the, that, it's not about that. It's about a spiritual transformation that happens. About gaining access to a power we don't have until we start this discipline of reading our Bibles. And the last point, the Bible gives us power to number three, have hope. The power gives us the, the power, the Bible gives us power to have hope. I love how Psalm 119, he says this. It's so beautiful that I, that I picture this in my head. I'm like a visual person. Verse 25, I lie in the dust, revive me by your word. I just picture that, someone just lying on the ground, just exhausted and just hurting and broken and says, revive me by your word. Word. A couple verses later in verse 28, it says, I weep with sorrow. Encourage me by your word. The Bible gives us access to a power to have hope when we don't have hope. I can't tell you how many times I've been discouraged, depressed, broken. I'm sure my parents could get up here and tell you, 50, 60 years of hurting and broken, yet the Bible gave them the courage, the power to have hope. It's how we don't give up. It's how we don't give in. It's how we don't go back to our old style of life is we have hope in God's word. Revive me with your word. Encourage me by your word. Why? Because I don't have the power on my own to do it. This is why we develop habits of reading God's word to have access to a greater power. Why? Because God's word is alive and powerful. But it's not powerful to you if you don't read it. It's not powerful to you if you don't know it. In fact, I want to share with you an example for me personally in my life. This is an actual example. You could ask staff on the church, other people. This is an actual example how it's powerful to me. And as I share it, I want you to notice it may not feel as powerful to you, and that's okay because this is a word that I've hidden in my heart. And you may need to hide some words of God in your heart so they're powerful to you. Years ago when COVID was kind of at its height, man, it was really a discouraging time for everyone. So I I don't, I'm not trying to say pastors had it worse. No, it was difficult for everyone. 
But in my world, it was hard because church was always being canceled. Half the musicians had COVID, or we had COVID, or maybe we had COVID, and we had to stay home, and you couldn't see family, and it was just very discouraging and very rough and very hurtful and, and, and very like maybe our world's falling apart. And then the division in the church happened, and that was really hard for me, that I was just trying to do the right thing, and I don't know if I made the right decisions, but you, people got mad if you wore a mask. People got mad if you didn't wear a mask. People got mad if you canceled. People got mad if you didn't cancel. And I didn't know what the heck to do. I was just trying to do my best. And it's just attacking and attacking and attacking and attacking. And I found this word of God that was hidden in my heart. And it's hard for me to read without being emotional because there's a power that it gives me because it's in my heart. It's Lamentations 3, chapter 20. And I I can't even tell you how many times I've read this verse. It says, I will never forget this awful time. Man, I'll never forget that time. As I grieve over my loss, yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. So I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. It's a beautiful verse. There's power when I read that verse to have hope in a hopeless world. And now maybe I read that verse and you think, eh, it's okay. Yeah, I don't really like it. That's okay because you know what? I've hidden that verse in my heart. And there might be some verses that God wants to begin to impart and hide in your heart. That verse may change over a hundred times over your lifetime, depending on the situation you're going to. But as we read God's word, all of a sudden one day he's going to speak to you. It's going to go into your heart. It's going to be there. And you're going to begin to have access to a power you didn't have before. It's beautiful. I can't tell you how many times I've shared a scripture verse with somebody. You ever do this? You share a scripture verse and you love it. It rocked your world. And you share it with them. Like, yeah, that's okay. That's okay. Because that word's not for them. It's for you. It's what you needed. And that happens when you're reading God's word and it's hidden in your heart. How can I stay pure? By obeying your word. How do I overcome temptation? I've hidden your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. What happens? We read God's word. It's a discipline. Don't read it because I told you to. Don't read it because that's what Christians do. Read it because you have access to a power you wouldn't get otherwise. And we need it more now than ever. This is why I want to start the new year off right by reading God's word together. I'm excited. In fact, what I want to do is we're going to sing, but I want to pray over you right now, and I want to pray as we begin to read our Bibles that we don't read it out of religious obligation or duty. I want to pray that as we read our Bibles, we just let it speak to us. And you know what? You're going to have to work through some days where you're busy. For me, where my kids are jumping on me, screaming, and I want to yell at my kids because I'm reading God's Word. You know, it's like, it's kind of counterproductive. I don't know. We're going to have to work through those things. We're going to have to find time to do it. We're going to have to work through the beginning of Luke where it's just the whole, the whole ancestry of Jesus. And it's like, who? I can't pronounce these names. Why am I doing this? You're doing it because there's a power in God's word that we need and we got to keep reading it and I can't do it on my own and I may want to give up. I may want to quit. Life may get more difficult. But when I have God's word hidden in my heart, oh, I have access to a power. Let's just stand as I pray over you. Lord, I just pray right now over each person here. I pray over myself. As many people, they probably read God's word and they're just going to jump in. in. Many people, this may be your first time. Many people, you might have tried many times before and you just quit. That's okay. Because we're going to do this not because we're supposed to. We're going to do it because God's word is alive and it's powerful. And Lord, I pray right now as we begin to read God's word, it may not happen on day one, it may not happen on day 24, but one day we're going to get access to power.
to the person struggling with anger, to the person struggling with uh, no focus, you just can't focus, to the person who feel like they've lost motivation to live, to the person who feels like they have no purpose in life, to the struggling marriage and the struggling parents and the struggling financial. Lord, I just pray as we begin to read God's word, your word begins to give us access to a power we didn't have before, that we could be sons and daughters of God, that we can live the life you called us to live. In Jesus' name we pray.